When did you actually start talking about this series? You've got 30 years or more of making extraordinary series about the natural world, many with Sir David. So when did you actually start thinking about how you might do this one and why Netflix? A fundamental thing we decided to do, if we were going to tackle um, the environmental issues, we needed to make sure we had our facts right. And so we teamed up with WWF from the word go as well because they, every two years, do a thing called the Living Planet Report, which is basically an audit of what's going on in the world. And that really formed the, the factual spine um, to what we were going to actually do. And that, it was that combination, actually, of um, WWF and Netflix, I think, that turned out to really help us to achieve it. It's a delicate balance, isn't it, to actually inform and entertain and punch hard with the messages. And I guess, just coming to you, uh, Sophie, you, you're responsible for that film. Mm. Um, where did you start? The really important message of our time is actually to differentiate between sea ice and land ice. And this film, the narrative, was then spun of sea ice. Um, and the important thing to learn about sea ice that I hope came across in the film is that um, the first section explains how sea ice works. It explains that it's an ecosystem, it's this upside down Serengeti world where you have, you know, the ice produces life and it supports a great abundance of life and that abundance far from the shores like South Georgia, these sub-Antarctic islands that are exquisitely full of life all depend on this sea ice system. Just to go back to the walruses, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> what did you know about that story before you actually went out and started researching it and seeing whether you could capture it. And this one scientist I was put in touch with through an old contact um, called Anatoly Kochnev, and he'd been su he's been studying for 35 years these, these walrus haul-out sites. In 2009, he discovered this site which over 100,000 walrus every year are turning up at this site, um, which he believed to be nearly three-quarters of the world population of these walrus. And then the cliffs, which is a story we totally weren't expecting no, at all. I mean, I'd, I'd heard reports of, I'd seen very basic footage of old footage of Alaska, of them sort of tumbling down verges. But what we never expected, and we, turned, we were all pretty shocked that A, a walrus can get to a top of an 80 meter cliff. I mean, that in itself, we didn't expect. The tragic thing, it was heartbreaking and shocking at the same time was they don't know how to get down, you know. And, they basically walk themselves off. The thing has gone viral. It has become a symbol of climate change. And, and so I guess it's the right thing to have shown it. But um, yeah, I also watch Gogglebox and, you know, you watch that and you think, my God, we've done that to so many people. So the shock, but there's also the revelation that everyone thinks we've got to do something about it. It is an extraordinary sequence to have captured. So you're yeah. on a recce and you're looking at it and you're going, wow. Okay. We were there to film it, yeah. We were seen on the beaches, you know, unbelievable. Like, we'd never expect it to be anything like that. We thought we'd see a few thousand, but 100,000 on the beaches, just unbelievable. And then when they're on the cliffs, you want to see that, you know, you go there to film them tumbling down to show this polar bear interaction or something. You want something dramatic to happen, but as soon as it started to happen and you've seen the images, it was just horrendous. Like, we didn't want to film it. You've got to film it, take the images home and show people what is actually happening, but it's definitely the most horrendous thing I've ever seen. And... Where were you and um, what sort of lens were you using? How far um, away? We were at the base of the cliffs, not in their way, trying to stay out of the way so we're not moving them with a 1,500mm lens. So um, quite a long way away, but um, yeah, close enough. Ollie, you were, you were there with some new kind of kit to, yeah. to capture something up by the, the walruses themselves. Yeah, no, definitely. So we, um, drones obviously came out right at the sort of beginning of, um, of the filming for this, this series. And, um, uh, and yeah, and the drone for, for this was obviously really key because you could see the sort of big spectacle of it and also quite how precarious where they, where they were placed. Um, but yeah, but we were about a kilometre away, um, really just staying back as far as we could from it just to try and make sure that the drone was as far away from the walrus as possible. And yeah, so we could kind of see more of the kind of big scale of it. So is that the first time you used drones in that, that kind of uh, environment? Yeah, we Do sort they of, work easily there? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> they're not really built to be in the high Arctic or the high Antarctic, and they're certainly not built to be cold. So um, in the Russian site, we actually got the, uh, the local guys to run a, a power cable uh, from sort of the nearest town all the way out to us, just so we could get a, a little heater to, to keep the drone warm and, and fly it. So. With regards to it being a very sort of eco-conservation heavy message, um, whether there were any particular steps that you took 
either in pre-production or on location to sort of minimise the impact of the production. If you want to show the natural world, uh, you have to travel to the four corners of the earth to, to do that. Um, but, you know, we, we offset our carbon and whether what people think about carbon offsetting, that's a, that's a debate in itself. But I think we've tried to do what is right. But I think at the end of the day, the equation is, is, is the environmental cost of making the film worth bringing the story back to enough people to bring about change. And on that basis, I'm happy. The thing with climate change and all these things is people feel overwhelmed by it. They feel that, what can I do to make a difference? And actually, people can do a lot and they don't think they can. And that's one of the messages of the series is actually, you know, you can do stuff and it will make a difference. And so we just need to kind of be positive about that and not negative about it. Um, but it's a good question because it is something that's definitely on our minds constantly.